Hey everyone, just wanted to say um, thank you everyone for coming for this second session of summer internship presentations. Um, last week was really fascinating and cool. I'm expecting no less from this week. No pressure, everyone. Before we begin, I wanted to uh, acknowledge, though, the traditional owners of the land on which we are meeting today. I think most of us, including myself, even though I couldn't be there in person, uh, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. Um, hi, everyone. So I'll be introducing Yvonne, who um, was my intern this summer, and uh, fairly differently to what, Ru to, to what Ruby was asked to do. I had a very specific goal in mind for this internship, um, which required heaps and heaps of work. And um, as you'll see, Yvonne really smashed it um, to the extent that, you know, we got everything that we need to done and we've even you know been able to submit the paper already so um yeah Yvonne will print this work um she's going to present like the whole project generally um even though yeah she was sort of mainly focused on one specific task which was creating all the stimuli which you'll see um she you know she'll tell you about that um but if you have any questions or <laughs> think the methodology or analyses were crap that's on me so <laughs> just to be clear yeah um yeah but we're happy to ask questions about those but yeah i'll choose now thank you Kadiga. good morning everyone i hope you had a pleasant day so far so have you ever found yourself faced with a claim or opinion um and despite your best efforts determining its truth seems like an elusive task because i know i have in a world saturated with information deciphering the truth can be a daunting task. So picture this, you are scrolling through social media and you come across a post claiming that perfect avocados are getting harder to find. Now, how do we form an opinion in such situations? I mean, really, what, does, what makes an avocado perfect anyway? So a potential cue that we often rely on is our tendency to be swayed by the number of people agreeing or disagreeing with a claim. So consensus effect, as the term suggests, refers to a shared agreement or opinion among a group of individuals. So think about it. When a lot of people seem to agree on something, it tends to carry more weight on our minds. Now, why is this important? Well, evidence has shown that people are generally more convinced by something when multiple individuals share a similar opinion. So consensus actually plays a significant role in shaping how we form our beliefs and make our decisions. So as it turns out, there are different types, kinds of consensus and not all consensus are equal. There's this independent consensus where opinions formed by individuals are not influenced by each other. So in simpler terms, everyone arrives at their own conclusions independently. So dependent consensus are is that when opinions are formed by individuals, they are influenced by the same source, making them dependent on each other. So considering how a consensus is formed is important. So generally, a consensus formed independently tends to be more convincing than one where individuals rely on the same sources of evidence. So now the question arises, are people actually sensitive to source independence? So previous studies have suggested that Surprisingly, people are not that sensitive to the independence of a consensus when reasoning. So these studies often found no effect. And when there is an effect, it is only in specific contexts and it is generally very small. So building on this, Alistair and colleagues use a fake social media paradigm to distinguish between different consensus effects. So now we'll just take a closer look at the basic procedure that was employed by Alyssa and colleagues in their 2022 study. So first, part participants will view a claim and they will rate the extent to which they agree with it. And next, they will read four tweets where people gave their opinions regarding the claim, citing some evidence via retweet. So these tweets could all to either all be cited from the same primary source as shown in the slides, or they could all cite from different primary sources. So after reading those tweets, participants will re-rate the extent to which they agreed with the initial claim. So in summary, they only found a small effect of source independence. 
such that people were only slightly more convinced by independence. So is there an alternative explanation for this instead? I mean, what if there are actually topic and individual differences in this consensus effect? So most research actually only focus on the group level effects rather than the individual differences. But our current research focus specifically on both the topic and the individual differences in these consensus effects. So our study delves into how different types of claims may influence consensus effects. So this is the topic level differences. So some types of claims might be more likely to elicit certain consensus effects. So we investigated four different kinds of claims. There is this unknowable expert, um, these are claims where the truth is currently unknown and it requires expertise for evaluation, um, for example, like economic forecasting. There's also the unknowable preference. So these are claims that has no clear answer, where expertise is less relevant. So it's all about what you prefer, really. For example, like, do dogs make better, cat, better pets than cats? And there's also this knowable fact. So these are claims that can be checked and confirmed by experts. So it is like a fact that can be verified. For example, like um, there's this new discovery of a new species of jellyfish. And lastly, there's this noble eyewitness. So these are claims based on things that people have seen happening. Um, for instance, like a mayor saved a child from a burning building. Okay, moving on, there's this individual level differences. This refers to the different ways individuals react to, co to consensus. So there are four possible types of people. There are people who are not persuaded by consensus at all. There are people who are persuaded by consensus, but they generally, generally do not care about the independence of the source. There are people who are more persuaded by independent consensus and people who are more persuaded by a dependent consensus. So to investigate this, we will need an extensive set of claims. To be more exact, we Need, we needed 60 real-world claims um, distributed among four distinct types of claims that was mentioned before. So for example, AI technology like ChatGPT should be banned for use in schools and colleges. So just to show you what we actually need for each claim in this experiment. So for each claim, we need four tweets from primary sources that supports the claims with photos. And, we, and for each of those four tweets from primary sources, we also need a user who is retweeting that tweet. So as you can see, there are four, four retweets needed. And we also need four tweets from primary sources that opposes the claim with photos, and as well as four retweets. And lastly, we also need three preamble social media posts, which is basically just introducing the claim to the participants before they actually read the tweets. So in total, for each claim, we actually need about 19 social media posts. And for 60 claims, we actually need 1,140 social media posts in total. So in addition to creating this extensive social media content, we also have to organize all of this information for the claims into a specific format designated for this experiment. So this is actually mainly what I did for the most part for this research which is making the stimuli for the 60 claims and putting them all into this structure format for the experiment. So clearly there's a lot of work that needs to be done because there's like 100 stimuli, that over 100 stimuli that's needed. So initially we considered two methods, which is to hand write all the social media posts, or we can use the ChatGPT website uh, using the search bar to, to help it, to do it. So both options do not seem very practical. So to streamline and automate this process, the most efficient approach is to leverage the OpenAI application programming interface. So this OpenAI API allows you to communicate with the ChatGPT model through the writing of code without having to directly access the ChatGPT website. So this enables us to seamlessly request ChatGPT to generate the stimuli tailored to our specified claims. So to make the process even more automated, I developed a custom script. So this script will compile all the generated stimuli from the ChatGPT API, and it will organize them into the required format for experiment. So for example, um, you can just input a claim 
perfect avocados are getting harder to find. And the output will be 19 social media posts pertaining to the claim. And you'll be in the correct data format that can be inserted directly into the experiment code. So this is basically just a screenshot of my script. My apologies if you can't if you can see it. It's over 500 lines of code, so I couldn't possibly minimize it further. But, gen but so I won't go into the specifics of it. It does, but generally what will happen is all I have to do is just run this entire script and it will output into a file that looks like this. So this is a content file which contains all the information, all the social media posts pertaining to a claim. So as you can kind of see, it is in this structure format that is you can just easily copy and paste it into the experiment code and it can and the experiment will just run by itself and kind of like that. So it's not perfect, but I think it's the most efficient and time-saving approach as it really helps to automate this process in generating the stimuli for the experiment. So lastly, I will just run through the results very quickly. So in this research, we have three experiment conditions where there are four tweets citing from four different sources and the dependent condition where there's four tweets citing from the same primary source. And also there's this contested condition which has no consensus effect at all, meaning that all four tweets, no, sorry, sorry, meaning that two tweets will be supporting the claim and the other two tweets will be opposing the claim. So there is no consensus effect. So this group level figure shows how much people's beliefs change after seeing the different kinds of consensus across different types, different claim types. So people are generally more persuaded by the consensus trials shown by the blue and the red bars compared to the contested trials shown by the purple bar. So the difference between the contested and consensus trials are bigger for noble claims compared to unknowable claims. So this individual level figure shows the result of our statistic, statistical modeling. So I won't go into much detail about it, but the top panel compares consensus to no consensus trials. And the blue dots indicate people whose beliefs were not influenced by the consensus. So generally, people are, except for three of them, are persuaded by consensus. So the bottom panel compares independent consensus versus the dependent consensus. So again, most people, blue, the blue dot, were not sensitive to independence. And there was a subset of participants who were both more convinced by independent sources and more convinced by the dependent source. So that's all for me today. Thank you very much. And then lastly, I would like to take this time to thank Matia for agreeing to supervise me and for the CSGH for having me this summer. It truly really has been a wonderful journey and I appreciate it. Thank you very much. So we have time for one question. Um, and we can obviously have more questions after. Um, I was just wondering, this is more like a speculative thing, but did you have any thoughts on why some people might be more swayed by dependence? Because that seems like counterintuitive. Um, well, it seems, well, to be honest, I think it's because that like, when we see multiple people agreeing on something using the same sources, I guess, it means that all these people have already evaluated like the source and they think that that source is kind of like good, I guess. So that makes me people think that, oh, maybe that source can be trusted since many people agree with it. I think that's why people yeah. generate it. Awesome. Yeah. Hi everyone, my name is Sam Dennis. Um, the World Health, Health Organization uh, estimates there are about a billion people who have a mental health condition. So about uh, 380 million people have a anxiety condition, about 360 million people have a depressive condition, and of course everybody hurts sometimes. Now the current um, mental health system really can only deal with a very small percentage of that, um, of that need. And so some of you may be aware that um, we've been building a, a um, startup around using large language models to, um, to try to address some of that need. Um, yeah, the question is, is that a good idea? Um, and some of you have been in some talks within this very hub where um, it has been strenuously debated as to whether that's a good idea. Um, so I mean, the first part of Amanda's um, project was about assessing the literature to see what we actually know about that. And then the second part was to ask what, um, if we're going to uh, do this, how are we going to interact with the existing mental health system? So we don't want to come in and impose a new method without actually 
assessing whether that's going to integrate in a useful way with the, with the current mental health system. And so that's the second part of what Amanda's been doing, and she's been doing it extremely well, as you will see. <laughs> Thank you. So hi everyone, I'm Amanda, um, and so I've been working with Simon and with the Mental Health Hub to kind of do an investigation on uh, what kind of evidence exists that supports the use of mental health chat bots for improving people's mental health. And I've also been looking into client and clinician perceptions of mental health chat bots. Obviously, as Simon said, we want to integrate this into our current mental health system. We need to do it in a way that is acceptable to both clients and to clinicians um, so that we can work within the system that is already there in order to create better outcomes. Um, so with that being said, um, so mental health chatbots are chatbot systems that are designed to facilitate um, therapeutic conversations and exercises to improve the user's mental health. Um, up on the screen is a list of currently available and in development mental health care chatbots. Uh, mind you, this isn't an exhausting list, exhaustive list of everything that's out there, uh, but these are the most uh, popular and widely used bots. Uh, however, not all chatbots are created equally. There are a couple of different types of chatbots based on um, software architecture and how the user and the bot interact with each other. So firstly, there are guided bots uh, where the users can only communicate using uh, predefined responses that are offered to them by the system and all the dialogue used by the bot in response to those user responses is completely prefabricated. So, you know, you'd log on to the bot and they'd say, hi, how was your day today? And you'd get a button that, button that said good, average or bad. And you could only choose to say good, average or bad. And based on that, the bot would use decision tree to bring back its next response for you, um, which is different to encoding bots. So encoding bots operate using machine learning and natural language processing and they analyze free text that is provided by the user. Um, and then the bot will use an algorithm to select an appropriate response from a very large bank of prefabricated responses uh, using kind of keyword analysis to pick apart the sentiment of what the user has provided it. Um, so while it appears that the bots are writing personalized messages to you, they're actually unable to generate any original content. Um, and then decoding bots are the most technologically advanced. So these are your chat GPT style bots that use generative AI um, in order to generate original responses to the free text that the user inputs. Um, and this is Alice. Alice is our experimental um, decoding bot. So she uses generative AI, she's built using a GPT model. Um, that we are developing at Mental Health Hub in order to offer more personalised and higher quality digital mental health intervention um, as compared to most of the previous bots that are all guided or encoding systems. They don't offer that personalised aspect um, that really kind of understands what the user is saying. Um, so this dialogue on the screen here is a uh, an example, I guess, I gave the prompt to the bot here saying, you know, I'm sad, I failed an exam, I'm going to have to repeat a subject. It feels like, you know, whatever I do, it's not really good enough. And you can see here that this was just the bot's initial response to that prompt. Um, the bot has gotten significantly better at kind of responding and replying over the last couple of months um, that we've kind of been developing it. And this was, um, it was, was screenshot was taken last week. So this is where the bot is currently at in terms of its capabilities. Um, so do the bots work was a really, really important question that we wanted to be able to kind of pick apart. Um, and thankfully the evidence points to yes, mental health chatbots can, uh, help people improve their own mental health. So these results up here are from pre post within subject designs and it's demonstrated that mental health chatbots are effective for reducing symptoms of depression stress and burnout, substance craving and use, chronic pain, postnatal depression, and they can also significantly increase resilience. 
Um, furthermore, the evidence from these studies suggests that the more that you interact with the bot, uh, the greater the reduction in your symptoms and that individuals who have higher baseline symptoms of depression or stress and burnout, um, they benefit most from intervention by the bot, whereas people who have lower levels of symptoms benefit a little bit less from the bot. Um, results from randomised control trials also support the therapeutic efficacy of mental health chatbots. So ch chatbots have performed better than weightless controls and psychoeducational information controls in reducing symptoms of mental health disorders such as substance abuse and depression, respectively. So the graph on the slide here is from the pilot uh, randomised control trial for Wobot. It was completed back in 2017. Uh, it demonstrated that over a two-week robot intervention as compared to psychoeducational control, uh, there was a significant decrease in depressive symptoms among 70 different college students in the US. So you can see there the information control at baseline and two weeks later was practically the same, whereas in the group where the individuals had access to robot, their depressive symptoms significantly reduced. Um, excitingly, we've also had some randomised control trials that support the idea that mental health chatbots are not inferior to traditional talk therapy interventions. So uh, currently there are only two RCTs that are comparing bots to clinician-led interventions. Uh, one is the Leo and colleagues paper here, um, which compared depression and chronic pain symptoms two months after surgery between a condition of patients who received no mental health care, a condition with patients who received standard in-person psychological treatment, and a group of patients who had access to the chatbot YSA. Um, they all underwent orthopedic surgery for their chronic pain, and they had all screened positive for clinically significant anxiety and depression before their surgery. Um, and it was found that the chatbot intervention was just as effective as the psychologist for treating depression and chronic pain symptoms. Um, but the bot was actually more effective than the psychologist for treating symptoms of anxiety and increasing levels of physical functioning. Um, the other study that we got here, it's a Gleason and colleagues study, which is actually a current randomized control trial that is currently being um, uh, conducted in the US at a children's hospital. And it compares a robot intervention to a telehealth group therapy intervention in a group of children aged 13 to 17 who were triaged at a children's hospital for low impact outpatient treatment for anxiety and depression. And the initial investigation demonstrated that both the robot and the group therapy intervention significantly decreased mental health symptoms, um, but they were also, there were also non-significant differences um, in the decrease in, in symptoms of anxiety and depression between the two groups. Um, you know, single study evidence is all well and good, but meta-analytical evidence, although there's not a lot of it, um, uh, it does support the fact that mental health chatbots are um, uh, effective in reducing symptoms of at the very least, depression um, and distress. The results are a little bit more mixed for anxiety, psychological well-being, negative affect and stress, um, but that's just because there isn't really a lot of um, eligible randomised control trials out there yet that are eligible for meta-analysis. Um, so the table here is just designed to quick give you a quick overview of what the conclusions the meta-analyses came to. And the grayed out areas are areas where these specific meta analyses do not investigate um, bots. Goodness. Um, so this here is one of the uh, forest plots from the largest meta analysis that compared 32 different randomized control trials. Um, and it did support the fact that chatbots were more effective than control conditions for treating mental health conditions. But as you can see, there was quite a bit of variability between the different studies in meta-analysis and the overall effect size was not very large. So they've used Hedges G, which is um, pretty comparable to things like Cohen's D. So Hedges G of two, 0 0.29, um, which is you know positive and it is statistically significant, but 
it's not that big. Um, so more kind of research is needed as we get more high quality evidence um, supporting and also not supporting the use of mental health chatbots. Um, the meta-analyses just need to get bigger, really, so we can actually decide whether or not these are worthwhile interventions. Um, now, along with efficacy, it's also really important to understand what clinicians and clients think about these bots, because they're the ones that are going to be working with and alongside the bots. Um, and if we want to integrate our solution into the mental health care system, we really have to understand what people are looking for and what people are concerned about. Um, so this study just up here was a scoping review of 37 different studies uh, looking into what, um, what clients and users think about mental health chatbots. Um, so just broadly, uh, people were generally uh, willing to talk to mental health care chatbots, which was really good. Um, you, they perceived them as very useful, highly trustworthy, and they really liked the confidentiality um, around chatbots. However, they thought that um, a lot of the chatbots, because they were um, guided systems or encoding systems, their responses were superficial, they were shallow, and they were repetitive. And the bot really couldn't understand when they were allowed to input free text. It wasn't very good at picking apart exactly what they were talking about. Um, and in regards to what clinicians think, this survey here was a survey of 100 different mental health care workers regarding their perspectives and experiences with mental health chatbots. Um, and it was found that while they do think there are a lot of benefits to mental health care chatbots, um, a lot of people have significant uh, issues with the risks that are posed by using mental health care chatbots um, at a very large scale. So, you know, they did think that, for example, um, chatbots will be able to help people better manage their own mental health care. It'll improve access and the time it takes to access mental health care. Um, but they also thought that, you know, um, using these mental health chat care chatbots would disconnect people from their providers. Um, the clients not may not be able to really kind of tell the bot what exactly is that they're going through. The bot wouldn't understand them. Um, and a lot of the people really didn't think that the bot would be able to kind of accurately diagnose and the clients would be able to accurately understand what the bot's saying to them. Um, uh, but even though the, the uh, clinicians in this study had all of these uh, concerns, they did overwhelmingly say that chatbots were important resources and that they were likely to prescribe the use of a chatbot to their clients. Um, however, but in this study just down here, this was a study of about 800 different psychiatrists, 40% uh, of people were very uncertain about whether the benefits of mental health chatbots outweighed the risks, and a further 25% thought that the benefits would not outweigh the risks at all. Um, and that is where I kind of come in. I've spent the last couple of months since November working on developing a, a battery of interview questions for mental health professionals um, to kind of gauge their perceptions and their understanding of mental health chatbots. So I've conducted a literature review, I wrote and reviewed the interview questions, um, and Simon and I submitted an ethics application two weeks ago that's just come back for pre-submission review, which is really exciting. Um, and so we're looking to recruit mental health care workers and interview them to figure out exactly how they feel about mental health chatbots. Um, so quickly, in conclusion, the existing guided and encoding bots have been demonstrated to be effective with small to medium effect sizes. Uh, clients find the bots useful, but they're repetitive and they're shallow. Um, clinicians do think the bots have benefits, but they are quite concerned about the risks that they pose. And our team is going to continue to develop our bot, Alice, and we're going to hopefully be able to do this study and get a better understanding of what clinicians think about mental health care chatbots. Thank you. We have time for one question. Uh, we obviously can ask more later. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask, because you mentioned confidentiality of the bot, but is it really confidential? What how would they handle the issue of privacy? Yeah, that's something we've been discussing a lot in our group. Um, though, uh, specifically on the clients thinking it was confidential, they were much more um, kind of 
focused on like the superficiality and like yeah 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 um the clients like weren't really thinking about like ethical or philosophical implications of the bot they were just like oh I enjoy talking to something that's not actually a human that's not going to judge me um but yeah we've been talking a lot about data privacy on how we're going to handle that um and it's looking very complicated but you know we've got a lot of really um kind of smart people working on that so one of the things a lot of people don't realize is that the way that um the transformer models that underpin chat gpt and so forth the way they work is actually based on um an old model of um human memory and so uh, called minerva 2 and so one of the um questions you can ask is well then you know if they have this kind of basic mechanism that looks like a, a real memory model might it be the case that um, they'll actually do a good job at um, reproducing uh, people's responses in memory um, kind of paradigms? And um, we wanted to investigate that, but also look at, um, you know, use data that's actually coming from people's everyday lives as opposed from um, laboratory um, circumstances. And so um, that's what UPIM has been doing. Hey, everyone. Um... I cannot see any of you, so um, I can only see like the four or five people in the Zoom room, but I'm sure there's probably quite a number of you here. So um, I'm Yupin. I recently graduated from my computing degree here at University of Melbourne. And I just want to start by saying a huge thank you. Thank you to the Complex Human Data Hub and to Simon for guiding me through this journey. And it was really nice of him to show me the ropes, and I've learned a lot from this. So let me just take in. Let me pose you a question. Where were you yesterday at 7 p.m.? And are you able to recall this fact? So, yep, and stop me if you can't hear me. <laughs> so yeah, where were you yesterday at 7 p.m.? So I'm asking this question because there is this very famous case in the memory literature, uh, the case of Ronald Cotton. And so Cotton, as you can see on the left here, he was sentenced to life and 50 years back in 1984. And this was for two counts of rape and two counts of burglary. And so in about 10 years after he was incarcerated, he was released because the DNA evidence that they found actually proved his innocence. And so on the right here, you can see Bobby Poole. He's important because the victim, Jennifer, she actually misidentified Cotton three times. And the most important takeaway here is that Cotton also misremembered where he was at the time of the crime. So this was a week before when he was testifying. And so let's contrast that a little bit with what I've just posed. Were you able to recall where you were yesterday? And here, Cotton was not able to recall where he was a week prior, or rather he misremembered. And as such, his alibi couldn't really be corroborated. And jurors thought he was probably lying. So the reason why I bring this up in this important case it's because I think we still lack a lot of empirical data and theoretical models that can act, that's actually rigorous enough to support stakeholders in the justice system. And as such, this is my attempt, or rather Sam and I have worked together to attempt to sort of further understand um, how maybe large language models can sort of handle temporal information, how that is compared to humans, and what we can take away from large language models when it comes to temporal information. So let's talk about the stuff that I worked on. Um, this data was collected from a study by McKenzie, I believe. And what was done was that they walked around with smartphones like hung around their necks. And for about two to three weeks, they as they went on their normal lives, a lot of data was collected about them. So their movement, uh, where they were, so locational information, audio segments were recorded, and they also had to respond to a little scale just to uh, discern how they were feeling. So the emotions you can see there. So these were the data collected across the two weeks. And so we will call this the event data for now. And then there's also the experimental data because in the paper that McKenzie has done, after the data was collected from participants, a week later, they were these same participants were actually asked about their whereabouts. So for example, here you can see the question is asked, where were you on Thursday morning 
8 a.m. on the 15th of August. So four points were placed and humans got about 67% of them correct. So not too bad. And this is where I come in. How do large language models compare to this? And are the mistakes any similar? My task mainly was to translate this information such that large language models can sort of understand it and give us the results to analyze. So I have a look at the methodology. What I've done first was to pick a large language model. And um, a big one that we went with was ChatGPT. And so we went to GPT 3.5, actually. And so we have to create the instructions on how ChatGPT should respond. So that's encoded as sort of a system role. And then from the events file that I said earlier, the events data, I pulled all the relevant information. So the date time, the location, and then this is sort of given to ChatGPT as this encoded information. Then after all that's given, we sort of prompt it with questions. So earlier on, you saw the experiments file that has the date, time, and the four options. So where you were at ABCD, that's sort of what I'm trying to do here. And then, yes, these are just API calls to ChatGPT. And then eventually I'll save it as a CSV file. So if you think of this as like a little sandwich, I'm giving it the instructions, and then the event trials, and then I'm prompting it with questions through the experiment trials. So let's have a little look at, oh, sorry. And then that's the analysis part of this, obviously. So after I've saved all the files, we can sort of look at what it might look like. And that'll be for later. But I forget how I've worded the prompt. So this is the instructions. And so today is, so the day and date here are referring to a week after the events that have occurred because we're trying to replicate what humans have gone through. They were asked after a week of retention. So here, we're just trying to replicate that as best we can. And the ChatGPT's task is to judge the location based on time. And so here are two examples. And that was what was given. Then the events were encoded in this format where they're given the day, date, time, and the location. So Tuesday, 20th August, 8 a.m., you're at location zero. And then when we were prompting questions, so the experiment trials, we were asking it, where were you on the day, the date, the time, and the four uh, options. So that was the base case. And we realized that as we were working on this experiment, small changes here could actually impact a lot. So here's a little segue into the different ways we went about wording these prompts. And so in the dependent case, which is sort of what you just saw, it was all of that, but it is in a more natural chat GPT style of uh, prompting. So we've given it the instructions, we've given it the event trials. Then every time we ask it a question, you can sort of see it like a little conversation where you can still see, or you can still have the context of the previous questions as you are being asked the new questions. And that's different to the next case, which is the independent case, because we then removed all of the context and only gave it the instructions, the events, uh, trials, and then only ever asked it one question. Then we tried this weird spacing thing where instead of 8 a.m. with it stuck together, we spaced it apart because we realized it was tokenizing them slightly differently. And we've also removed the example from the introduction. So this part, we no longer have the examples. We took them out. This is called a two-shot uh, method. So in this case, we actually turned it into a zero-shot prompt. Then from there, we decided to reword it a little. So we brought forward the time because we realized that um, time is a huge discerning factor in deciding where you might be. And it seems that ChatGPT might not be picking, up, picking it up as well. So in the rewording case, the time is brought forward in the prompt, followed by the day, then the date, instead of day, date, time. So it's a bit of a rewording. And likewise, it's independent with zero shot. Then in the very last case, I mentioned earlier that there was some additional information that was actually recorded uh, with the participants. So what was done is we've added in a bit more. We've given it the audio clusters, the accelerometry clusters, 
and see if there was something that ChatGPT could inherently work with here. And they were prompted like this. So you heard sound something, and then you were doing movement something. Right. So let's have a look at the results, which I think are pretty interesting. So this is the accuracy. Um, we have the different cases here. And the red line at the top is how the humans were formed. Earlier, we mentioned about 67%. And the baseline is the chance percentage, which is about 25%, because it's a one in four choice. And we can see that when we removed the dependency, so we removed the context, the additional context for chat GPT, it started performing better, adding the spacing and removing the examples actually made it better here as well. Rewarding it increased its accuracy slightly. And for some reason, adding additional information weakened it a little. But um, I guess the important thing here is that chat GPT performed better than the baseline, but it's still nowhere near what humans can do. And performance, as we can see here, is really sensitive to small changes in the prompt. Next up is the match of when the human and chat GPT is wrong. So let's say if there's a question that the human and chat GPT got wrong, what is the likelihood that they give the same output? So this is the percentage match. And as we can see, I think it's cool to note that the dependent case was relatively high to begin with. And as we move to the independent cases, it actually took a hit. And we see the same trends again. The baseline here is that 33%, because once you take the correct answer out of the equation, you're left with three options that ChatGPT can match with humans. So it's one in three chance. And I think that's a cool thing to know here, which is why the dependent case might be relatively high to begin with. And that could be because um, dependency reflects how the real world works. Um, you don't just forget what I said earlier, or like it just doesn't exist in memory. Rather, it's stored as context encoded in your memory. And as such, um, it may have a higher, hatch, a higher match rate to humans because of that. Uh, and if we use some of the other formattings with the dependent case, I feel that they may also be a slightly higher match, perhaps. But that's obviously something that I should be exploring more. And yes, this is the last graph I'll show you. And this is a breakdown on how humans made its um, predictions and how ChatGPT made its predictions. So this is a confusion matrix saying that, so let's look at the left one, humans. When it's week one, a set of these humans managed to predict in week one, but there's a small subset that humans incorrectly recalled as week two. So the left one's humans, right one's GPT. And this supports what was stated earlier, that GPT is not as good as humans, which is why we see the error rate higher here. But I think that's a cool thing to note here. It's that... ChatGPT, as you can see here, the percentages are quite flat when it comes to the errors, but humans have a slight bias. And this bias is more on predicting week two when it's actually, in fact, week one. So this is actually in the literature what um, some what was proposed as forward telescoping. So I think Hutton Locker, what this person proposed was that unbiased encoded information that is subjected to errors when the when the event is more distant, which makes sense. If something that I've told you early on is further away than what I've just told you, you're more likely to have errors regarding that information. And this bias is also um, proposed in literature as forward telescoping. And what forward telescoping suggests is that distant events are reported as more recent. So. That's kind of what you see here, but you don't really see that with ChatGPT, which I think that's pretty interesting. And yeah, about 12 minutes. So in conclusion, um, ChatGPT's accuracy is higher than chance, but nowhere near as good as humans. And we saw in the second bar graph that the inter-trial dependencies, so the dependent cases, had a higher match when we conditioned it on the incorrect responses for both humans and ChatGPT. And then in the third result, we saw that humans show slight forward telescoping, but 
ChatGPT was actually pretty flat about its errors. That's it from me. Um, thank you so much for listening. Uh, thanks so much. You, I'll translate a question. We have time for one question, if anyone has one. Uh, Manikya? Um, this is maybe kind of a broad question, but to what extent do you think that the differences between ChatGPT and humans are to do with the like qualitatively different architecture that we have? I mean, like humans use, uh, you know, location information all yeah. the senses that we have, we're embodied, so like we can actually draw on where we were at a particular time and we were there, and that helps yeah. us with recalling information. Um, and, and we are reconstructing things that happen. We don't have some sort of probably don't have like model weights or some sort of like memory file that we're like recalling. You know, ChatGPT <laughs> essentially is sort of like word prediction and it's, it's a completely with you know some other things involved, but it's a qualitatively different architecture. To what extent do you think that's underlying those differences? Or could, if ChatGPT just got bigger, do you think it would do the task better? <laughs> Yeah, that's a really good question. I am struggling a little to come up with the answer for that. Um, I believe that it's not necessarily the case that if ChatGPT just was scaled up, it would necessarily reflect what humans might be able to do. I think the whole point of this was sort of just to understand and see if the state of large language model, or rather ChatGPT at the moment, is there something we can learn from its architecture that could be applied to memory models of our current understanding? And so, yeah, I think that's a very interesting question. And there's still quite a lot, a lot, there's a lot of debate around it. There's a lot of research that can still be done about it. Yeah. Did I answer the question? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. First, to all of the summer scholars, it's been great to have you in the hub over the summer. And I've appreciated the enthusiasm and the fresh ideas that you brought to the eighth floor. So enthusiasm and fresh ideas are two things I associate with Zoe in particular. She started a project last year as part of Advanced Grad Dip, an honors project looking at uh, bird naming across cultures and uh, took it in some interesting directions that I hadn't anticipated and built on those over the summer and wrote up a paper that she submitted to, to COGSCI this year. So Zoe was the ideal person for this project. She cares a lot about categorization and coding and cross-cultural comparison, and she's also knowledgeable and passionate about birds. So if you find yourself wanting to know the difference between quails and button quails, as I did at one stage during the project, Zoe is the person to ask. So it's been a real pleasure to uh, work with Zoe and I'm glad that she'll be around for a few years and that she's decided to start a PhD uh, in a couple of months with Vanessa and me as supervisors. So over to you, Zoe. Thank you very much, Charles. That was really nice. Um, yeah, as Charles said, my um, summer internship project is um, a COGSI paper about birds that we wrote together. Some of you saw my honours talk, but this is not going to be the same, so don't you worry. There'll be stuff in here for you as well. I don't know how to advance the slides. Um, so should I just click on it? Uh, great. Thank you. Um, I know we already had an acknowledgement of country, but while I was working on this paper, I was on a big road trip. So here are all the um, the traditional custodians of all the country that I got to spend time on while I was working on this. Um, I also want to acknowledge that the data sets that I'm talking about are living languages from diverse cultures around the world. So some background. Um, cognitive scientists and anthropologists have often noticed a great deal of correspondence between traditional Western um, systems of categorizing plants and animals and fungi, and the systems that are used by indigenous people to categorize the world around them. This is not the same magpie that Ruby was talking about. This is an actual magpie. <laughs> um, so modern Western scientific taxonomy um, aims to have a unique label for every single um, organism in the world and to place them into this rigid hierarchy, hierarchy of kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species that you all know about. Folk taxonomies are um, similar in that often there's this hierarchical structure seen, but generally they'll have names for only a subset of the local organisms and within that name subset, some have their own names, some are categorised together under shared names. There are competing theories that aim to explain this correspondence between folk and scientific taxonomies. 
The world centered view reckons that there's this objective underlying structure of the world and that both sorts of taxonomy reflect that underlying structure, making them similar. The human centered view that we think has been um, underemphasized in the literature, um, its idea is that both scientific and folk taxonomies are invented by humans using the same perceptual apparatus, i.e. two eyes and a brain, and this leads to their correspondence. And that, that says something more about cognition than it does about the structure of the world. So our theoretical framework for our study, um, we reckon that there are two factors that influence um, naming in scientific and folk taxonomies. The first of these is evolutionary similarity. So the actual genetic relationships between organisms that ultimately explain why they look the way that they do. The second is the uh, set of similarities that humans can actually perceive between organisms. Sometimes these perceptual similarities um, do reflect the genetic relationships. For example, in the case of ducks and geese, they look really similar because they are very closely genetically related. However, in the case of something like eagles and falcons, they look really similar, but they're actually only really distantly related genetically. I know, bird facts. Um, so for our study, we're introducing new computational capabilities and um, big data sets to, to tackle two main research questions. The first of which is how well different scientific classification systems account for bird naming. So for this, we're going to be um, comparing folk taxonomies to two different um, scientific uh, methods of um, of categorization. So the first of those is the traditional taxonomy that um, I was speaking about before. And the second one is phylogenetic trees that are um, created from really precise genetic relationships that we have now, which have been included into taxonomies from about the 90s. And our second research question highlights the role of human perception. And for this, we were inspired by Eugene Hun's perceptual model of categorization. So in Eugene Hun's model, he reckons that organisms are, um, are represented inside our brains in this sort of perceptual map. So things that we perceive as being very similar to one another are, are clumped really closely together and they're more likely to have a shared name, whereas really distinct things are further away and more likely to have their own names. So perceptual distance or distinctiveness creates these gaps between categories. So um, this is our study. There's a lot going on in this slide, but stay with me. So those four birds up there are, um, they're classed together under a shared name in the Anandiliaqua taxonomy. Uh, these are the taxonomic trees. I've had to flip them sideways so that they fit, but this still corresponds with the species genus family order in the class Aves there. Can we kind of get what's going on? If it, if it all seems a bit weird, stick with me because it's gonna become clearer in the next few slides. You'll see this all again. Um, so for our study, we've used um, four different similarity measures that are based on proximity in two different taxonomic trees, an old one and a new one, a phylogenetic tree and a perceptual space. So the data sets that we're using are languages of Tlingit that's spoken in Southeast Alaska, Zapotec that's spoken in Oaxaca in Mexico, and Anindilyakwa that's spoken on an island called Groot Island uh, in the Groot Archipelago off the Northern Territory. We're focusing on folk genetic categories. These are the categories that have been shown in the literature to have the greatest um, correspondence with the scientific systems. And they're um, sort of generally the label that you would use for a bird without looking at it really closely. Um, in, in English, folk generic categories include things like uh, pigeon, duck, and booby. So for our traditional scientific taxonomies, we've chosen the Clements bird taxonomies. There are actually a whole bunch of different bird taxonomies, but Clements is known as being the, um, the least contentious of these. So we've used two different ones. The first is the uh, first edition, which is the 1974 version. And it is um, it was created using the actual morphological differences between birds as seen by your eyeballs and your brain. Whereas the 2023 one, which is the most recent one, um, it still places birds in that rigid hierarchical structure. However, they're placed more based on their evolutionary relationships. Um, so our measure of um, taxonomic similarity for every pair of birds, so you can see two birds circled there, um, you just count back until the first taxon that they both appear in. So you can see for the uh, square-tailed kite and the black falcon there, their similarity is three in the 1974 taxonomy and four in the 2023 taxonomy. Um, Bird Tree is a website where you give it a big list of birds and it spits back out this gigantic file with all their precise evolutionary relationships. So we use that to create phylogenetic trees and then our measure of, phylo of evolutionary similarity is just the branch length um, between two birds and their most common ancestor. 
Avanet is this uh, other really exciting, massive new data set that has for every bird species in the world, really precise measurements. So it's got these nine measurements that you can see here, plus mass and a ratio measurement of the wing. So for our perceptual similarity measure, we just found the Euclidean distance between each pair of birds. Um, this is the 11 dimensional space projection to two dimensions. So it's not perfect, but you can get what's going on there. So the birds of prey are sort of clumped right together in the corner. Emu's really lonely up the top. The emu actually should be about twice as far away as that, but I cheated it in so you could actually see what's going on with everything else. Uh, our first analysis, I'm skipping this because I don't have enough time. I don't want Elizabeth getting mad at me and we all want to eat strawberries. So I'm going to skip this, but it's very interesting and cool. So come talk to me later if you'd like to know. Um, our second analysis, we used um, a logistic regression framework. So we used our um, four similarity um, variables as predictors and the outcome variable was for each pair of birds, whether or not they would share a name in the three taxonomies. So these are violin plots that show the effects of the variables on the outcome variable. The top row is the traditional scientific taxonomy, but I've only included the 1974 one here because they look um, virtually identical. Um, so we found that each one of our variables significantly negatively predicted name sharing in all three of the languages. And the best predictor for every language was the 1974 taxonomy. Um, when we uh, combined all of the variables together into models, we didn't use the 2023 taxonomy because of collinearity and we didn't, we found we didn't need it. Um, there's a lot going on here, but the thing you really need to know is that for every language, the best model included the 1974 taxonomic similarity as well as the perceptual similarity. Clinkett also included um, phylogenetic similarity, but the um, the direction of the coefficient were, was reversed. So um, can't really interpret that. So what does it all mean? Well, let me tell you. Um, so the correspondence between folk and scientific taxonomies has often been seen as support for the world-centered view of categorization. However, we think that our results are better supported by the human-centered view. The human-centered view um, explains both the correspondence between folk and scientific taxonomies, but it also explains why that um, correspondence starts to drop off as, um, as the taxonomies rely more and more on things that can't be perceived with the eyeballs and the brain. We also successfully operationalized Hun's model, and we demonstrated that um, that characterizing perceptual similarity in models of folk naming is um, is important and it can contribute predictive power outside of just um, comparing taxonomies to taxonomies. Um, how am I going for time? All right, I'll just skip over the limitations, but here's some cool words and the bat. Um, for future directions, we hopefully will get accepted into COGSI and go to Rotterdam and speak to the wider COGSI community about our birdies. Um, we've also identified a bunch more languages um, that we think that we can extend our framework to. So, um, so we can see if our results are robust over more languages. Uh, also in Avanet, there are six other behavioral and lifestyle traits of birds. Um, and if I manage to figure out how to include discrete variables in with the continuous variables, I'd love to go down that path too. So in summary, I guess what I want you to take from this is that Indigenous knowledge is very precise and very nuanced, and it's formed over thousands and thousands of years by really intimate, intricate relationships with, with the organisms and with the natural world. So if we can figure out ways to analyse um, languages which code in this, um, this knowledge, then we can get some really interesting and exciting insights into cognition which are far outside of, or, or just very different to what we could find by doing lab experiments. And just finally, thanks so much for the CHDH for like keeping me around after my honours year and letting me hang out. Thanks heaps for um, the PhD students whose desks are near mine. It's been a blast. You guys are great. And I can't wait to start my PhD and be one of you. Uh, and thank you so much for Charles for letting me continue on with this and let me do like real grown up science with the big kids. It's been awesome and I um and thank you for Elizabeth for um coordinating all of this and that's all I have for you guys today. Was there a question? Yep. Yeah.
outside of birds? Um, our framework is very specific to birds because we've used um, avenet and bird tree. And so far, there's not any other kinds of nets. That was actually sort of a point that I was going to make in my future directions. Uh, the, the bird... Um, the bird subset that we're using for Anindiliaqua, for example, actually should include bats in it. But so far, there's, as far as I know, no way of measuring a bat in a way that it can be meaningfully compared with birds. So using a perceptual framework in the way that we are, so far we wouldn't be able to do it for anything other than birds. Um, I think that the people who did bird tree also have like a frog one, I think, because they have a, a handful, don't they? So yeah, you might see me up here talking about frogs later. Um, but yeah, it's we're limited by the data sets and I'm perfectly happy to look at birds. So if I do it with birds forever, I'll be happy. And Maggie and I, Maggie Webb, who I think there somewhere, uh, worked with Red, who was also our honours student from last year. And his task, which he accepted, was to deal with an enormous data set that Maggie and I collected in 2019. I've been too scared to do anything with since then. 15,000 people given qualitative and quantitative responses on problem solving and insight. It's his job. <laughs> Fun fact about Redrick is, and embarrassingly, I have to check my phone for this, has the longest name that I've ever known anybody have. This is Redrick Nikolai Bernard Angus Walter Douglas Nugent Gromov. <laughs> which led me to believe at the beginning of last year I had three on students. <laughs> <laughs> and it took me eight months to work out exactly what his uni email was. <laughs> yes, there is much contention as to my paternity. Um, <laughs> hello. Um, so, yes, um, my name is Redrick. I'm going to take the time so I can uh, police myself. Um, yeah, my name is Redrick. And for the last six weeks, I've been working uh, with Simon and with Maggie uh, on the Citizen Science Project which was done in collaboration with the ABC. We used 15,600 participants who each completed 13 creativity problems, pseudo-randomly, I use that word incorrectly, um, selected from a pool of about 53 items, as well as supporting items measuring their subjective experience of, of the problems and of creativity in general. Today, I hope to explain the things I learned over the summer internship and what's next for the project. So, Here's a roadmap. Let's find ourselves a roadmap. Yep. Heck yeah. All right, sweet. So first, I'll situate you in, um, yep, that works, that works, cool. I'll situate you in creativity and insight research so you know what we're working with. Let's see if this works. Oh, heck yeah. Um, then I'll briefly explain the Citizen Science Project um, and how we came across such a huge sample and what that data looked like in its raw form. After that, I'll talk about the approaches I took to wrangle this data into something usable. Um, and finally, I'll touch on what we plan to do on what we plan to do with the scored data going forward. So understanding how to work with really large uh, with large data sets in a way that isn't only efficient but also makes sense of the of the participants' exact intention is, in my opinion, precisely the domain of the psych researcher more than other statisticians. Um, we don't just NA things because they don't fit our expectation. We change our expectation. Um, I'm So I'm just starting out with all of this. I have no idea how impressive it's going to be, but I love it. I'm excited to talk about it. Um, so section one, I mentioned earlier that this data uh, relates to creativity. Speci uh, specifically, it aimed to measure the relationship between creative problem solving and the experience of insight, which is also known as an aha moment. We should take a moment to grasp exactly what that means, though. An aha moment is uh, what happens when you look <clears throat> at a problem from a new perspective and everything sort of clicks into place. These moments often involve restructuring of a problem, um, leading to unexpectedly easy conclusions and feelings of certainty and satisfaction. Often that certainty massively beyond the uh, truth of the matter. Um, so in terms of research, a common way to measure inside problems is through creative problem solving. This method, this method is great because it's quantifiable, it's cheap, and it's replicable. You don't need to cause a life-changing epiphany to study inside. Sometimes you just need a, like a brain teaser. The value of creative problem solving 
um, specifically is that creative problems often involve impasse. The obvious path to solution is typically wrong. Um, so you have to back up, you have to try again. This sense of overcoming impasse is a common theme to insight. And when you figure it out, you get that aha. Now, of course, a challenge of scoring creative problems is that people find creative solutions. Um, for our purposes, we're just going to define creativity in problem solving um, as finding an unexpected or uncommon solution, which other people will agree is correct. Um, that will come up. Creative problems often have many solutions, um, even when there should only be one. They are by their nature difficult to define and to solve. So sometimes there are valid, valid solutions that the author didn't actually intend. I actually discovered two uh, non-standard solutions to problems that should have standard solutions um, in studying this, which was great. Um, but just by reading other people's, I'm not that smart. So, and for scoring, I personally, I like to divide creative problems into two categories. That's closed-ended uh, problems and open-ended problems. Let's go. Heck yeah. So closed-ended problems are sort of like this one. Um, they're those where the researcher has one particular answer in mind. So this is the compound remote associates task. Um, each of these words can be combined for, to, for, with a single fourth word um, to make common compound words or phrases. So try to give that while I give you a moment. So one word should pair, pair with all of these. So the answer is I. Um, oh, they paired terribly. So it's I shadow, I chart, and I drop, I believe. Chart I? Okay. Um, yeah, I shadow, I chart, I drop, right? Um, if you managed to get to solve the task, you may have gone through this sort of explorative guessing phase, producing uh, a word which works for one or two, and then you'll test it against the others. Um, this separates the two sort of primary ideas in creative problem solving. Uh, divergent thinking, sort of getting out there, and convergent, where we converge onto a conclusion um, through a testing process. Um, do, 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 do. But you can see how I had one idea in mind, right? So that's a closed-ended problem. Problem, of course, is I discovered a uh, box also works. Um, ever since uh, Microsoft produced the Dropbox service, um, now that happens. So that's a non-standard one in literature and it's going to be standard when I'm done with it. <laughs> um, right, so open-ended problems, they have no correct response. Um, instead, they give uh, we give criteria for a valid answer and then we score your creativity. So consider the alternative uses task. Um, take a moment and try and think of a creative and non-typical use for an ice tray. Do not have time. So um, depending on your creativity, you might have thought about it. Uh, you might have thought to use a seed planter. That's great. It's still a storage tool um, for identical little things. So you can see how it's not all that creative. Um, sorry, if that was your idea. Um, you could use it for, as a fake six pack. <laughs> Fantastic. I need one of those myself. Um, or you might throw it at unpopular politicians. Um, <laughs> The respondent to this was a 70 year old man from the UK, um, which is understandable. I, I, he's, I, I, there are a lot of funny little comments I, I could make about historics, uh, historic politics, but polite company. So um, given what a complex topic um, creativity is, you might want uh, a lot of data to figure that sort of thing out. And this is where the ABC comes in. Incredible. So every year the ABC participates in a national event which is called Science Week. Um, unis, libraries, museums, other and others coordinate for a massive science education event. Hi. Ooh. Um, it's a lot of fun. I love it. And one of the things the ABC likes to do is they run this citizen science project um, where lay people get to participate in scientific research. Um, so like often people will like categorize frogs, um, tons of really cool nature stuff. But in 2019, Simon and Maggie got it. Now I get to say we, um, so we got that. And so for a whole week, the ABC is spruiking our study, uh, uh during their national science event, they're putting it online. They're putting it on the newspaper, taking it to schools. Um, and so that gives us incredible distribution. Um, however, they did have one rule. Um, we do not talk about it. 
Um, no, we had one rule and the rule was we have to keep it to 10 minutes per participant, which is terrifying because you also have to get their emails, you have to get their ethics. Um, but ABC just didn't want to get people getting bored and pulling out. So that was the case. You can see how this shapes the resulting data though. We have a very large sample to me measure a very woolly construct and we only have 10 minutes per person. Um, that huge distribution means that we got participants ranging from seven through to 70 years and above, coming primarily from Australia, but from, also from over 112 different countries. To make the best of our 10 minute time limit, we ended up using a multiple matrix sampling approach. Um, so each participant completes a randomly selected subset of items from each scale that we've provided. What I think is really interesting is the motivation of this group. Um, so most of us here have worked primarily uh, with students or with MTurk, people who are here for an extrinsic reason. They need grades or they need to get paid. Um, so they end up seeing, I'm going off script here, but they end up seeing um, the task as well, a task as a hurdle, something to jump. I've got to get to the end of this. They might be interested, but that's secondary to their goal of completing the um, scale. So, however, in this, people can leave whenever they want. They only came here because they read a fascinating article, they clicked on a link, they went, heck, why not? Let's learn about creativity. So they're intrinsically fascinated and that's reflected in a lot of our research. Um, I found just whenever we added, is there anything else you'd like to say? Paragraphs and paragraphs of people talking about creativity. This one time they had a light bulb moment when they were putting a light bulb in. It's incredible. Um, it also changes the uh, nature of their mistakes. Um, you don't get errors of people writing as little as possible. Uh, there's almost no chat GPT, though I haven't checked and uh, you, that'd be fantastic. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so there's like, oh, but there are other errors. People get confused. Um, people kind of go down their own little rabbit hole, tell me what I should have been doing. And so there is still a lot of attention to be paid. And my task was to score this massive thing. Um, each participant's giving like 31, no, sorry, each item had about 31,000 responses. Um, the challenge was uh, that most of the items were answered with strings. And since creativity involves unexpected thinking by its nature, tasks had to be scored very thoroughly. My work in this internship was learning flexible solutions to common problems, uh, which any of us might encounter working with, with questionnaire data. Um, Sweet. So what I did is I categorized my items into three sections. Um, we've got your descriptives. That's just stuff I pretty much prepped it and I was fine. Um, closed ended items is where I'm seeking a specific answer. And most of my job is making sure I haven't um, found something inc incorrectly marked that thing is correct. And then open ended was the nightmare tasks. Um, that's where it, I had I spent a lot of my time just sort of thinking, how am I going to go about that? Um, closed-ended items, uh, actually really straightforward. You just create a bunch of stuff and then you use an if else, this is not a loop, this you nest a bunch of if else statements. Um, and that's mostly done. And then I would just filter by incorrect, make sure I haven't accidentally gotten anything wrong. So for example, that box example happened when I filtered by incorrect and then I uh, basically put it all together and it said, oh, gee, like 200 people have answered box to this. And I thought, oh, wow, that's fantastic. Um, and then you filter by correct, make sure you haven't accidentally marked people correct. It's repetitive, but it works. Um, so um, here, take a look at this example. Um, this is called the degraded picture task, which is you just saw the scoring for it earlier. So I hope you didn't see the uh, answer. Um, what is what is this? Um, so there's a proper line drawing, but you're only seeing part of it. Um, it's a box. However, 350 people answered dog, which is fair. Um, there's not enough in the case of this to say that it's not Lassie. Um, that being said, also 230 people said horse. So would you consider call calling this a horse a genuine mistake or an acceptable mistake? Um, that is what most of my time was spent doing, um, largely in committee. Um, we were talking about what counts, what doesn't count. Um, I could write a whole article on how we ended up categorizing just making these decisions. Right, and then this brings us to the open-ended items. So you'll return, you'll recall the alternative uses task from before, the um, 
cycle one the right um you're yes yeah, so the alternative uses task that one used a large language model i'm gonna have to power through this stuff but essentially um creativity turns out uh, more creative people can reach further in a sort of semantic network. So their responses are going to be more semantically different, right? Seedlings are a household object, the uncreative answer, kind of um, that. Whereas throwing things at politicians doesn't have the same sort of, isn't very semantically close to ice cube tray. So a large language model can actually just do that by finding the cosine distance um, and all sorts of stuff. The divergent association task is, oh boy, I would love to talk about that, but I shan't. Um, <clears throat> there was a really fun technique here where I was going to doing some spelling check, some spell checks here. Um, and I didn't actually decide to use a um, package because packages are just like weird and fuzzy. I know with this lo-fi solution of just putting it into Excel and clicking um, spell check. And you can just use ignore all and change all. And it's like super efficient. You're using like tabs and enters. Um, so sometimes the solution really is just the easy thing. Um, nope, ask me about that later. Um, right, so, and then we've got these classic insight puzzles and they were very challenging and I'm not done with them. But basically the classic insight puzzles, we gave, there were 20 riddles that we gave people. Just an absolute nightmare to score um, because so in this one here, I hope that we've read the one, read it. The solution is basically um, 11 minus 7 is 4, 4 plus 11 is 15. So you turn them both over, and then when the 7 is done, you run the egg, and then you're done, right? So it's a pretty simple process, but the wording of it, you just cannot control it, the answer to that thing. You cannot use ref you, because there are no special keywords the user, the participant would use to indicate that they've solved it. So what do we do? Well, it turns out we actually kind of did that already. Um, we asked participants, we gave participants the answer after they answered it, and then we asked them, have you figured this out? Um, they say yes, they say no, or they say, I did figure it out, but I didn't get your answer because you're an idiot. Um, and what I'm currently in the process of doing is just, I'm using signal detection theory basically to compare um, to measure something like honesty. I don't really want to call it honesty because I think people often make genuine mistakes, but basically I'm comparing whether we objectively scored them as correct during those closed answered items and whether they said they were, tell whether they told the truth basically, or whether they believe that they were wrong. And that's going to help me to identify sort of problem participants um, or sort of problem problems that are particularly prone to being incorrectly scored. Um, it was fantastic. So this is the last slide. What happens? Um, at the end of the day, what do we end up with? A huge amount of data and so much qualitative information. It's incredible, the explorative knowledge. People just love to talk about thinking if you can get them into it. Um, and if you've got the time and passion, then you can really discover some fantastic stuff. Um, I'm hoping to get me a couple of fun, well, a couple of fun publications based on the use of large language models to do stuff. Um, eventually, I might even figure out a way to train a machine to correctly I lit, read the answers to riddles and score them for me. Um, but at the moment, um, all I'm going to be doing is learning to code and hanging out with you guys. Um, thank you very much. Awesome. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much to all of our summer fellowship students. It's been amazing to listen to your presentations and to hear about all the work you've been doing. I just wanted to thank, so say fun. thanks to everyone again for some fantastic work, supervisors, students, but also Elizabeth, who I think was the, um, the motor that kept everything actually working. So yeah.